This is the 2022 Ontario Winter Bible School. Our speaker for this second session is Brother David Bailey from the Christ Church, New Zealand, Ecclesia. His theme this week is talking with God. This is his first class, and the subject for this class is what is prayer? Our reading was taken from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. Brother David? Good afternoon, my dear brothers and sisters and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely for us all to be here, isn't it? It's a, it's a wonderful subject that we have to consider. Um, Sister Carolyn and I bring with us, we were specifically asked to bring the love and fraternal greetings of your brothers and sisters at Christchurch West Ecclesia is um, our home ecclesia. And um, uh, as I say, it's a, it, it is lovely to be here. I, I mentioned the importance. We, we, we all know the importance of prayer. But we constantly are reminded of that in the Bible. We have such passages as pray without ceasing, pray always, and everything by prayer. And yet it's evident, brothers and sisters, that we have problems with prayer. Most of us do have problems. We, we struggle with it. And if we struggle with prayer, then we are struggling with our relationship with God because prayer is a barometer of our relationship with the Father. Now, in the first part of this talk, I want to stop and analyze uh, the problems that we have. I did a survey some years back now with uh, a couple of ecclesias to try and ascertain what these problems were. And the, the, the results of that survey were very sobering and enlightening. The predicaments that we have generally fell into two groups. I need to turn it on as I mentioned to the brother Daniel. This is just a sample of the issues that came from the survey. Concentration, it's a big one, isn't it? Repetition and sameness and content and language. These are people admitting to this, having problems with these things. Tiredness, um, finding that we're too busy, wondering whether God answers our prayers and, and so on. And most of these, these uh, problems fall into the realm of motivation. Now, I also asked respondents if they had questions about prayer. And these are some of the typical questions. Should we use through the Lord Jesus Christ or in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and variations on that idea? Should we pray or can we pray to Christ? Does Christ filter our prayers? Is he like a filter through to God, as it were? Should we keep our eyes shut? How do we know when our prayers align with God's will? Because we know that it should be according to his will. How do we know that? I need on tips on how to pray so that God will hear. These are genuine questions that people ask. And can I get it wrong? And really, that last question sums up all of those in the second or these, these questions that people have. Really, it's all as if prayer 
is some technical process that one must get right to make it work. So we find then that we have two co principal causes for our problems with prayer. A technical approach and motivation. The, this is my summation of those uh, surveys that we conducted. They did, they fell into these two categories. So let's consider each of these. First of all, a technical approach. When we want to get it right, we really mean that we're looking for the thing that will make our prayers work, that will fix our prayers. But anything that's a magic pill usually always spawns other problems, and they do. Brothers and sisters crave practical advice about prayer. That's been my history and the truth, and that advice has been given. But unfortunately, what happens is that we turn that advice into rules about prayer. And that generates formulaic prayer that disempowers prayer and our spiritual life and therefore our relationship with God. It's a ritual. We often hear people using this, and this is, I have to say right from the beginning, if I say something that sounds critical, it's not meaning to be critical. It's analyzing the problems that we have. To be honest, most of the problems I, I reflected on myself and my own prayers, so I include myself in these things. So please let that be understood. When we hear, this is the kind of thing that shows ritualism in prayer. We hear expressions like, saying our prayers, we'll say a word of prayer. As if prayer is a procedure that we go through. And then there's, we'll just give a short word of prayer. We hear these expressions, don't we? I know I've used these expressions. It's like an, an apology for occupying time in something we're obligated to do before we get on with the real stuff. Now, the telltale signs of formulaic prayer is when they're cluttered and clogged with cliches and platitudes. Now, you may recognize some of these. We ask that you guide, guard, and direct us. This dark and degenerate age, bless both speaker and hearer alike. We come in the way appointed. We come before thy face. We humbly approach thee, or we humbly beseech thee. Bless these gifts or this food to our use and us and thy service. We hear a lot, and I've got a great long list, many of which are my own that I've analyzed. So what happens is that we use an expression that strikes us as eloquent. And so we use it again. And eventually we use it by default. And then others pick up on that and they use it too. And we find security in such expressions because they come readily to mind in our prayers. These expressions are like the treasures that we enshrine in our homes, pictures, um, plaques, photos, ornaments, quotations, and we put them in prominent places. And for a while, they strike us, but after a while, they just merge into the background. They become part of the furniture. 
and the well-used ornaments and quotes and pictures in our prayers are just the same. They have the same effect. Now, the expressions aren't at fault, but they've become automatic. And if we're honest, brothers and sisters, without thought, and therefore that's dishonoring to God with whom we speak. But the problems go deeper than stock phrases. We've also got stock prayers. And at times, you know precisely what a brother is going to say in his prayer because those are the things he always says. Now, that's often a security uh, mechanism for some people, particularly who struggle with communal prayer. It's a fallback. But the problem doesn't lie with those people with that problem alone, does it? When I analysed my prayers, I found I have stock phrases, stock subjects and stock order in which I say them. It's like a default prayer that you say. The stock prayers contribute to the sense of sameness and blandness in our prayers, lifeless and mechanical. It becomes ritualistic. Now, these stock phrases and prayers must also be a factor in that great problem that we do have of concentration and prayer. It's a universal problem, especially in communal prayers. Now, it doesn't need someone or something else to blame for our lack of concentration. I experience it when I am giving the prayer. I can speak the words, but my mind is on something else. Now, how can that happen? It's those cliches and platitudes again. And what happens, they sit in the subconscious mind and they entice me into this automatic mode. And out comes what I always say, allowing my mind to dwell on something else. It's like driving a car. And then there's the rules that we've made about prayer, probably in our attempt to get it right. Prayer should open and close with praise. Prayer should contain scripture and to some people only scripture. We should use in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of our prayers. And it's the congregation that should say amen, not the praying brother in communal prayers. I've heard all of these things. I, I, I don't know whether you have, but they are things that I've heard. And then there's those that throw the book at anyone who gives longer prayers, citing that incontestable clause, let thy words be few. And there's scriptural support for such ideas, brothers and sisters, but making them imperative is to err. For the Lord Jesus Christ did not always abide by these rules, nor did the Apostle Paul, nor did many of those whose prayers are written in the Bible. So in our endeavours and our obsession to get it right, we get it wrong. So what should we do about these problems with formulaic prayer? What's the answer to these things? Now, that, that's the technical side. Now we should move to the motivation for prayer. And our desire to get things right also affects motivation. 
We hear that a prayer, our prayer should be sincere. So we try to sound sincere. We pray with our prayer voice. It's a different voice to our regular voice. Perhaps because we're trying to be reverential. Some prayers are so eloquent and passionate and so dramatic, you wonder whether it was meant to be witnessed rather than consented to by the, the, the congregation, let alone the Father in heaven. It's a prayer performance. I've seen brethren, thankfully not many, but I have witnessed brethren aping evangelicals by laughing and crying in prayers. Not that I think that's wrong, crying, but it's dramatic. Ostensibly to show their joy or their humility and our Lord in the very passage we had as our reading warned us about praying to be seen of men. Exhibitions may fill some with admiration for the person who prayed thus with himself, as the Lord said, but deflates others. And it fills them with doubts. People struggle, people that are honest, people trying to do the right thing. And they witness this and they think, well, if that's what's required, I can't do that. And they just give up because it's so, so beyond them. It's not their experience. And there's also how we talk about prayer. It's even how we write about prayer. Some of our writings. We, and once again, I am not trying to be critical of anybody. I'm just trying to analyze what the problems are. We speak about prayer sometimes that's so unhelpful. We talk about prayer in great swelling terms that enshroud prayer in a mystique. We, we speak of the comfort of prayer. What do we mean by that? As if prayer has this power to envelop us and to warm our hearts. Now, that's not the experience of many. And it's not found in the Bible in that way. We know that. We can see the way that they pray. It's an open book in the Bible. The language discourages. It's as if people are really striving to have this feeling with God because this is the closest we get and we've got to have this feeling so we feel close to God. I, I tend to think that we often borrow some of this language about prayer from Christian writers. Here's one who was a prominent, uh, he's, I think he was in the 1800s, uh, and E.M. Bounds, and much of his work is quoted by Christians today. This is what he said, prayer should not be regarded as a duty which must be performed, that's okay, but rather as a privilege to be enjoyed, a rare delight that is always revealing some new beauty. So while arguing against being technical, Bound speaks as if prayer is something mystical, something almost magical. A power that causes us to revel in delight. As if prayer is all about what we get out of it. But we find no such mystical magic in the Bible, in people's prayers. 
Our brethren have also spread warm and fuzzy sayings about prayer. This is one that, that I happen to see. When you make prayer a habit, miracles become your lifestyle. Now, many Christadelphians assented to this and gave it a like. But is the saying true? Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by habit and what you mean by miracles. But where's the substance? We can't rely on platitudes for spiritual sustenance. I think a lot of this lofty language arises, as I mentioned before, out of this desire for some kind of feeling with God, that we know he's there, that he's with us. We desire this confirmation of God's presence, that he's hearing us. And the problem is we can't see him and he doesn't talk back to us with words. We don't receive direct answers from him. But it begs the question then, how can we be assured of God's acceptance of us and our prayers? Another problem with motivation was that of busyness. Many of the people surveyed admitted to this, that even the internet took up far too much time in their lives. They admitted that that got on the road of their time with God and prayer. But a lot of it was life is so busy, uh, there's just not enough time and so on. So that our world, Lord's efficiency, Time management, multitasking, to-do lists, and, and so it goes on. And so we've, we've got to be the very best we can be. Success requires it. And all the jargon that our world is filled up with and we get caught up in it. And so there's fascinating technologies that, that absorb our attention and that allow us to be available 24-7 and employers Customers, friends, family, everyone expects your availability. And it has impacted on us personally, in our family and ecclesial lives, let alone with our relationship with God. So how do we fit all this in, brothers and sisters? How do we fit God into our lives? What's the answer to this? And, and that's what we want to look at, God willing, through our series. Answers to these things. And we're going to go to the Bible for those answers. I spent five years analyzing this and, and going to the Bible. And I'm not saying I'm any kind of guru, but let's go together and look at these passages. And the answers are there. And it's very, very powerful because we can see in the Bible people that prayed and we, we, we can learn the secret that enabled them to have a relationship with God and speak to him like he is real and that he is there working in their lives. We can see this. So let's begin with some foundations. We need to answer the question, why do we need to pray? Does God need our prayers? Does he need our prayers? Without our prayers, God can't act. Well, a God that needs renders him impotent. Is something he is not. His word reveals that it is God who is in control and it is we who need him. So is it because God won't act without our prayers? 
James does say, doesn't he, that uh, you don't receive because you ask not. So it all depends on us to pray for things to happen. So if someone leaves the truth or someone who is sick dies, it's because they didn't pray enough or didn't pray the, the right way or it was the right people didn't pray for them. How does that work? That too makes God impotent and it's very, very legalistic, isn't it? God becomes like a genie. If we don't rub the lamp, he won't or can't come out to grant our wish. So is prayer solely for our benefit? We sort of touched on this. And, and there is a, a, a quite a substantial argument put forward that this is the reason for prayer. Not necessarily in the brotherhood. So is the reason solely for of prayer for our benefit? Prayer comforts, calms, invigorates, strengthens faith, much like modern meditation. And they say this is the sole reason for prayer, so that we get this feeling and these good responses and, and so on. Well, if if why pray at all? If all we get is some inward edification, we all we need is the word for that. I'm not belittling the word. And why pray to God, the other party in this act of communication, if it's all about us? And why pray thy kingdom come? if it's all about personal edification. You see, that's God's purpose and his work. And that back begs another question. Why pray when God is in control? Now, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8, if, if you have that open, it said there in verse 8, your father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. So why pray if God already knows? And why does Paul, the apostle, several times ask brothers and sisters in various ecclesias to pray for him in his work, if it's God's work? And for that matter, why did the apostles in Acts chapter 6, verse 4, say, it's not meet for us to serve at tables, but our job is to minister in the word and prayer. Those are the two things they singled out that their work was not to be impinged upon, and prayer was one of them. Why on earth was prayer needed by the apostles when they were guided by the Spirit and doing God's work? And, of course, that leads us to the question, why did Christ need to pray, which he did often? Wasn't God working through him, with him, in his purpose? Here's another passage about God's purpose. I'd like you to turn with me to Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62 and a verse 6. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of Yahweh, keep not silence and give him no rest till he establish and till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Now I've heard brethren say, that we can bring the kingdom. We should be praying harder. 
Really? We've already shown that that is not right. That God needs us to do something for him to do his work. It can't be right, can it? Psalm 102 and verse 13 says, Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, for the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. There's a set time in God's purpose to favor Zion. God has these things all in hand, in his hands. It's not as if our prayers alter his purpose or his mind or his timing of things. God has predestinated everything according to his purpose and works all things after the counsel of his own will. Ephesians 1 verse 11. It's all in his hands. So what's the answer to this? Well, the answer lies in why God's own son needed to pray. Come with me to Hebrews in chapter 5. And in verse 7. Hebrews 5, verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. I want you to notice two things. First of all, his need. In that Christ revered God, crying unto him to save him, shows his need for the Father. And secondly, that in Christ obeyed his Father through all these sufferings that required his prayers, shows us that Christ involved himself in God's purpose, which happened to be in him. Two things. His need, and he involved himself in God's purpose. Christ was dependent upon his father. And Christ worked with God in his purpose. Those are the reasons that he prayed. You think that I've come up with something? How do I get that? Well, it's there in those in, in those uh, that verse. But it's an, you'll find either or both elements in every one of Christ's prayers. For example, in the garden. Christ says in Matthew 26, verse 39, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So the two elements are there. His dependence upon God. He asked God to take the cup away. Only God could do that. And secondly, he was working with God's will or purpose. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. And the apostles prayed for the same reasons. They were involved in God's work, but they were dependent upon God to accomplish it. And this is the twofold reason for prayer for us as well. It shows our dependence upon God, our need, and it involves us in God's work. It's our involvement with him. Now, we, we mentioned we, and we read Matthew uh, chapter 6 and the Lord's Prayer. It's a model prayer, isn't it? Christ gave it as a model prayer. 
It contains those two elements. Look, here it is here. It's in reverse. The Lord's Prayer is basically two sets of three petitions. That's the prayer. It's got, it opens and it closes, but that's the prayer. Two sets of petitions. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's all about God's purpose. We're involving ourselves with him in what he's wanting to do, what he's accomplishing. We desire it. We've involved ourselves with him. And the second set of three petitions, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our sins and as we forgive others and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil that's all about our a disciples need for god and there it is this is why we pray and you know being able to see this helps us with so many things about prayer in the first three petitions, the disciple involves himself in God's purpose by praying for his purpose to come. For the same reason, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And the second three petitions expresses our need for God. A father knows what his child needs before they ask, but they, he loves to hear them say it because it expresses their need for him. It's part of their development. And so these two principles show the purpose of prayer. Our need and involvement with God. It motivates prayer. Why we pray, what we pray for, and even how we pray. And as a basis of how God answers prayers. So the next question we should ask is, what is prayer? And it's a bigger question that we may have first thought, certainly was for me. What makes, when we commune with God, a prayer? Does it require us to be kneeling with our hands clasped or like this or flat on our face? What makes a prayer? Does it require a certain pattern of words or certain words? We have the special word we use for speaking with God called prayer. We don't simply speak to God, we pray to God. Do we pray to other people? No, we pray to God. So this makes prayer somewhat mystical. It's something different to what we normally do. And of course, anything we do with God is different in that God is holy. He is totally different from all of us. So it sort of makes sense, but is it real? Well, when we look at the Bible, we find that that, that, that concept of a different way of speaking to God or whatever it is that we call prayer, that mystical element is not there. Now, I want to show you this because in Bible times, particularly in the Old Testament times, but also in the New, people did pray to one another. There are two primary words for prayer in the Old Testament. is parallel and tefillah. Tefillah actually comes from the verb. Uh, the verb is, is the root word, parallel. And these words are used, as I say, they're the predominant words. And the verb is used of 
speaking to other people. In Isaiah 45, I'm just going to read it out just to save time. Toward the end of verse 14, it says, Concerning Israel, they shall fall down unto thee, Israel. They shall make supplication unto thee, Israel. It's Palel, saying, surely God is with thee. So Palel is correctly rendered supplication there. But it's to people. So the word can apply to humans. And immediately, some of the mystique about a special word for speaking with God diminishes. Also, while this, this word is the most useful prayer, it's, it's not the only one. In fact, there are at least seven others that have the same idea as this word palau, which basically has the idea of asking. And so we have all these words that mean the same thing. There's palau, tefila, paga, nathar, and Canaan, hanan, tekina, and so on. All of these words. So there are 11 of these. And then we can add to this list of words all the words that mean to call, because that's also these words are used for prayer as well, eight times. And then we can add the words for weeping or tears. It says in Job 16, verse 20, my friends scorn me, but mine eye poureth out tears unto God. So even tears can be a prayer. So all of these words, 22 of them, imply asking and need. Hear the echo? They all refer to our need. Well, there's another side to prayer, isn't there? And that's Praise. And what do we praise God for? Well, for him, for his purpose, his will, everything about him. That's involving ourselves with God and his purpose. There it is. There's two sides to this thing we call prayer. And so we've got all the words for praise now that we can add. There's 10 of those. And we can also add the words for rejoicing because they're also used for prayers. And there's eight of those. And we can add to that sing. There are two of those. So that's 20 words used for prayers of praise. So the Bible uses all these words for what we style prayer. So the Old Testament especially is especially rich. The Greek has its equivalent, but far less uh, words to use them to use. But they it definitely the Greek has their equivalents of these words that we've just looked at. But the point is this. There are lots of words for prayer, and there are common words for other things, used for other things, not a special word. And immediately what that says is there is no particular word for prayer in the Bible. And that fact ought to reduce the mystique surrounding prayer. That's and acknowledging that fact does not diminish either God or prayer. In fact, having so many words, surely that's telling us how wonderful it is, how expansive it is. It's special. So look how rich prayer is. But the fact is, brothers and sisters, at its base, it's very simple. Do you know what the most common word for communication with God is in, in the Old Testament? <clears throat> it's the word said. The word amar is the most common word. 
In the end, brothers and sisters, prayer is simply talking with God. And what an amazing thing that is for us just to talk with God. That's an incredible thing. That's what you do in a relationship, isn't it? It's not a ceremony. It's not prescribed words or a set sort of position or a special place. It's just talking with him. And we have that privilege. Now, I, I want to illustrate. Now, my wife is going to go get mad at me now because I'm going to ask what time I have to finish because we got underway at a um, got held up and I, I, I'm really lost as far as the time is. I did check my watch, but my... A few minutes before a second would be fine. Okay, so I've got 20 minutes. About. A bit less than that. Okay, that's fine. Yep, thank you. I'll just adjust accordingly, that's all. All right. I, I want to illustrate this talking with God, and we're just going to use Moses for as an example. We'll come back to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus 3, and Moses is at the burning bush. And he sees this wonder, and he goes to look, and in verse 4, it says, and when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh thither, hither. Put thy shoes off from thy feet. And then he goes on to say that he had heard the cries of the children of Israel and that he was come down to to respond to their needs. And then in verse 10, it says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, Who, who am I that, that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be the token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? And what shall I say unto them? And so it continues. Now, can we say that Moses is talking with God? I'm talking to him. Chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. But they will say, Yahweh hath not appeared unto thee. And Yahweh said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And so the conversation continues. And Moses is highly reluctant, isn't he? And then we read in verse 10, And Moses said unto Yahweh, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Well, that sounds very sort of similar to a prayer. You know, it's got the, the title of God, what we would normally find in our prayer. Um, and there's the humility and so on. And Yahweh said unto him, who hath made man's mouth or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I, Yahweh? And now therefore go and I will be with thy mouth. And verse 13, and he said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him with whom thou wilt send him. And the anger of Yahweh was 
that was against Moses, and he told him he was going to send his brother to be with him. And so off they go into Egypt. And they appear before Pharaoh. And of course, we, we know the result of that. And Pharaoh increases their burdens. And the, the officials are very upset by this. And so they make this appeal unto to Pharaoh. And in, in chapter 5 and verse 20, they come out from an enraged Pharaoh and they see Moses and Aaron standing there. Verse 20, and they met Moses and Aaron who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto them, Yahweh, look upon you and judge because you have made our savor to, to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. And Moses returned unto Yahweh and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil and treated this people? And why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Where did Moses go? It says he returned unto Yahweh. Well, he didn't go back down to Mount Sinai. He didn't go into the tabernacle because it hadn't yet been formed or a temple or a special room. Where did he go? And does that sound like what we would call a prayer? Well, it sort of sounds like what we would call a prayer. But it's not, brothers and sisters. He returned back to talk with God. That's all it is. It's a continuation of the same discussion. It's just talking. And that's what prayer is, talking with God. And when we look at it like that, brothers and sisters, it not only removes the mystical elements, but it also brings the reality of what we're doing. Just the thought of simply talking with God can fill us with awe and humility and an enormous sense of privilege. Talking with the Creator. The Lord Jesus Christ enables us to come into the presence of God, to talk with Him. That's a relationship. But this is no ordinary relationship, is it, brothers and sisters? It's not 50 50 or give and take like we usually describe a relationship. He's the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity. He's in the high and lofty place. And he humbles himself to behold the things in heaven, let alone the things on the earth. He demands respect from anyone who speaks with him. Now, I, I want to just conclude with showing a little bit of grammar. Boring. It's not really, because it describes a, a, a wonderful word picture. And, and, and I'm, I promise I'm not going to get too technical. In fact, to some that may be... Um, to truncate it. But anyway, this is what I want to show as the picture. The word parallel, which is the most common word in the Hebrew, has two stems. And a stem is something that makes the word do something. And, and, and that's as far as I'm going to, as technical as I'm going to get. Whoops. I missed a whole ad, uh, addition there of other words that we could have added to our pile of words, and that was about talking with God. Palau. It comes in peel, 
and in pit pale. In fact, the root idea of the word is in peel. It makes the meaning of the word meaning to judge, to assess, evaluate, to interpose. So it doesn't sound like prayer. What makes it prayer is the hit pale stem. That's it. That's what. How does how do then does hit pale turn the word, which means to assess, to evaluate, to judge, into prayer? Well, hit pale does a lot of things, but one of the things that it can do is this. It vests in a word, and I just want I, I want you to hear what this says. It vests the sense of putting oneself into the position of receiving the action from someone else. It sounds like the passive, but it's more than that. You are actually doing something. Passive is when you receive something from someone else, you know. Um, the ball was hit. That's passive. This is more than that. It's you putting yourself into a position, so you're active, that someone may do this to you. This is what Hippel does. Well, here it is. It means to place one's request before another to be assessed by them. That's prayer. Isn't it? We put our petition before the Father for him to assess whether he will act on it or not. That is prayer. And isn't that powerful? If we think about that, it's putting our issues before him. <coughs> and he decides. That's exactly what prayer is. Now, there are other Hebrew words for prayer that use the hit pale in the same way. It changes the meaning of the word into this. That's how it's used. Now, you know, the grammar presents this picture of someone who's superior assessing another's needs or desires. And, you know, there are many bas reliefs and engravings and so on of slaves and um, subjects and so on pleading the mercy of, of a superior. And they've generally got their hands outstretched and they're in various postures. They're either standing, kneeling, or even flat on, on their knees or even on their faces but often with their hands in the air. And there are lots of other pictures of people praying, which bar is, I believe, that this picture here of the Lord taking slaves and then pleading the mercy of that Lord is borrowed from prayer. And it's because they try to stand in the place of God these lords. Now, the Bible often has pictures of people standing with or even kneeling with their arms outstretched in this appealing way. Now, I, I'm going to leave out one. Um, I, I was going to look at a, a, an expression in the Hebrew. Well, it's in several places in the Bible, which actually literally means that, to throw down your petition before God, as if you're throwing yourself down before him. And it's showing us the humility that's required. And you imagine prostrating yourself before a powerful Lord to appeal for your life. Well, that's prayer and supplication. Realizing this brings humility. Would you put on an effective manner using flowery language? 
put on a prayer show? Would you have a, a good old yarn with like, as if he's your mate? I don't think so, brothers and sisters. You might be impassioned, but you'd be very reverential, direct, and plain. Because no royal likes affected people. No, any with any any sense of decency and power and, and, and intelligence. They can see straight through it. And it's the same with us, brothers and sisters. It's just a simple request. And it's done in a certain spirit. Now, I'm going to finish with, I take it that there's, there's a link to um, this morning's exhortation. I, I didn't hear the excerpt, I'm, I'm afraid, but um, about walking with God. Um, I, I take it from the prayer that there was some connection there. This is Micah 6 and verse 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth Yahweh require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. You know, you could find no more apt a description of a relationship than walking with a companion. To walk with God is to be in his company, to walk on the same path that he is on. That's his purpose. And, and to be involved in the same things that he is involved with, that he's interested in, to listen to him and to talk with him.